Hey everybody, I'm Angie Larson and I get to serve as the executive pastor here at Calvary and I'm so honored that you're joining us for worship today. We are in the very last week of our sermon series called What's Next? And through this whole series, we've been talking about how to take that next step in your faith journey, that next step in your life of faith. We've been talking about getting to know God better and finding freedom, to discovering purpose and making a difference in the world. In the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about generosity or leaning into giving. I wanna wonder with you today, why? Why does the church do things like ask you for money? I mean, if your family is anything like mine, we don't really wanna talk about money, do we? But I think the answer of why might really surprise you. So stick with me and we're going to wonder about it together today. Welcome to church. If you've been around Calvary for a while, I know that you have heard about my travels to Ghana from time to time. I've been involved in a ministry partnership in Ghana, West Africa called Globe Serve Ministries for about nine years. And I get so excited to share with you stories about it because it has really opened my eyes to God's work in the world. Most of this ministry partnership is doing things like distributing mosquito nets in remote villages. Mosquito nets kind of like this to prevent malaria. Now, malaria is this disease which is transmitted through mosquitoes. And malaria is the top cause of death among children, pregnant women, and the elderly. Last year in Ghana alone, over 400,000 people died from malaria. We also go when we're there and we distribute dewormer for kids, which, which rids their bodies of parasites that come with not having clean water. And so for years, for about a decade now, I have taken groups to these remote villages to talk about the impact of malaria and to give a gospel message for the village to hear as well. And as we pass out the mosquito nets to different households, we often take the children and go to an area nearby so that we can give them their dewormer. And also we give them a little snack. Snacks like we made here at Calvary, like when we made Meals from the Heart this past April. Now this snack, it's just that, it's just a little snack. It is nothing sustainable or long-term. It's just something to keep the kids occupied. While the kids are being occupied by eating and their parents are receiving mosquito nets, we open the little bottles of dewormer. We go and we sit these kids in these little circles and we have them wash their hands in a clean little bowl. And then we bring the food out to them and it's their chance to sit there and just have a little break. And all of a sudden, this busy village, it turns into this kind of quiet, holy little moment where the kids just sort of eat in silence. So many times, the big kids will make sure that the little kids eat first, that there is enough for everybody. And it's an amazing thing to watch, even with the language barrier. But one year, a couple of years ago, this, this wasn't the case. You see, Ghana is south of the Saharan Desert, and for half of the year, November through March, they're hit with what's called the Harmattan Winds, where this really hot wind blows over the Saharan Desert, carrying with it dust and sand from the desert and putting it all over the country of Ghana. And during this time, November through March, there's no rain. There's no rain at all. And all the plants, they go wither up and they go dormant. All the rivers and tributaries go dry and it's hot, like really hot, like Africa hot. 
Locals call this time of the year the dry season, and yet people have lived there for centuries. So they know that it's coming, and they plan for it, and they expect it. They store grain, and they dry food, and they store water so that they can sustain themselves until the rain comes back, usually in April. Yet at some point, all the stored food, all the water is used up, and the village experiences together what they call a hunger time, a time of the year where they wait where they wait for the next rainy season to come, a time where people lay still to conserve the small amounts of energy that they have until the next farming season. And they've done this for thousands of years, thousands of years farming and living on this same land. A couple of years ago in June, I I went to a village to do our mosquito net distribution and dewormer kind of program that we do. But this village, it felt different. It looked different. Not joyful and excited for visitors to be there, but there was a palpable tension in the air. And I could feel that everyone in that whole space was kind of on edge the second I stepped out of our van. And after being there for just a minute, I was approached by one of the village leaders who explained to me that the rains had not yet come that this community's hunger time had lasted for two months, two months. And you could see it in the eyes of the kids as they were glassed over and sunken. And you could see it in the bony structure faces of their mothers. And this leader, he asked me, he said, Pastor Angie, why hasn't God sent the rain? Why is our weather so different? And I I didn't know. I didn't have an answer for him. But then he asked me a question that I'll never forget. He said, where you're from, Angie? What is your hunger time like? And I thought, what is it like during my hunger time? And I thought about the protein bar that I had just eaten in the van minutes before, not because I was necessarily hungry, but probably just because out of boredom. What was it like? during my hunger time? Well, we're in our final week of a seven-week series that we have called What's Next? We've covered a lot of ground during this worship series, including knowing God and finding freedom, discovering purpose and making a difference. And for the last couple of weeks, we've talked about giving and how giving is the one thing that can keep us from fully living into the abundant life that God wants for you and God wants for me. And I don't know about you, but when I think about giving, I think about the times that people have given to me. How when my son Sawyer was hospitalized from a birth defect for six weeks, how the community of my friends dropped off meals and fed my family for three whole months. I think about the time when when I got distracted and I backed my car into a light pole, even though my car was warning me with a beep, 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 beep that I was going to do this. But I didn't have enough money to get this car fixed. And so I think about how my dad said, Angie, I will help you out with this bill so I wouldn't drive around with a broken trunk anymore. When I think about giving, I think about uh, grief after losing my mom, how a friend brought me a cup of coffee and cared for me. I think about all the places and all the time and all the space where people have given to me where people have come alongside and helped me in my distress, in my difficult times, my hunger time, time when I was hungry for hope or hungry for comfort or just hungry. When I think about those things, the feeling that it creates in me, I just can't help but want to give in that same kind of way. So I want to ask you today, what are you hungry for? Are you hungry for hope? Are you hungry for a reconciliation of a broken relationship? Are you hungry for healing? Are you hungry to feel like you are good enough? Are you hungry for love? Are you hungry for community, for some group to connect with, to hear your story and know you? Are you hungry to be freed and released of the pains of your past? Are you hungry for people to just stop fighting and learn to get along? Are you hungry for a time when your finances don't keep you up at night? Are you hungry for some downtime? Maybe a break in the relentless schedule that you feel like you have to keep? Are you hungry for grace? Are you hungry for a savior to keep you from your hurts, your hang-ups, and your habits? Or maybe, 
you're just plain hungry. After I contemplated for a while what it meant to have a hunger time, my mission team and I, we went out and we did our usual village visit. And only this time, the kids couldn't stay in their small little groups like we normally did. They were, they were edgy and they were restless. And you, the edginess, it felt just as palpable as the wind felt hot. And the teachers in that community, they worked really hard to help us keep some kind of order. And I held a bowl of the food that we were going to give them as a snack in my hand. And as I began to bring it out and place it into a small group of children, just as I was going to put it down, out of nowhere, a child came, maybe eight or nine years old, took the bowl out of my hand and ran into the field in order to eat it. And I looked around, and the same thing was happening to all the other volunteers. Bulls snatched, mothers grabbing food for their children, fighting. And quickly before I knew it, I looked around, and all the food was gone. <laughs> we looked at each other in frustration and chaos because there was hunger. There was so much hunger. And my heart broke as I looked into the eyes of these little ones that wasn't sure what was going on, toddlers who didn't seem to know what was happening, and my tears fell on the dry, cracked land as I knew that I couldn't do anything else to fix this problem. I took off my backpack and I, and I gave the extra food that I had brought to some of the smaller kids and to their moms, but at the end of it, I was completely impoverished in my own helplessness. I was completely at the end of my ability to do anything about this situation. Now, there's only one miracle in the Bible that is told in all four gospel stories. The gospels are the books about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's only one miracle that's mentioned in all four books. And I think because of that kind of repetition, it means that we should probably pay attention to it. But it has something important for God to teach us, for us to know and to understand about the character of God. And this is how the story goes in the book of John, chapter 6. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he performed, healing the sick. And then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. I want you to just imagine this with me for a second. Jesus here with this little kind of smirk on his face. He knows what he is going to do. He's already got a plan. He's already got it in mind, but he just wants to see what his disciples are going to say. He wants to know how Philip is going to respond to this question. And Jesus, he is ready for it. And so Philip answers him, Jesus, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to only have a bite. I want to unpack this with you just a little bit. There's this great crowd following Jesus, this huge crowd, and it's getting close to dinner time. So instead of assuming that everyone in this crowd is going to experience a hunger time, that they're going to fast out there on the mountainside, Jesus suggests that the disciples go and do something about it that there's work to be done in order to feed this crowd. I want you to see what the other three Gospels have to say about it. In Matthew, it says, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And Mark and Luke, you give them something to eat. You feed them, disciples. It's up to you to take care of this giant crowd's hunger. It's up for you to fill their bellies. It's up for you to put yourself out there. It's up to you to give you give them something to eat. Jesus invites his disciples into the giving. And this is what Jesus is about to do. And this is what Jesus invites us to do as well. Jesus invites us to be part of it. To witness the God math, the abundance, the thing that God is about to do. I get to serve on the board of the shelf here at the high school in Alexandria, of the food shelf. 
And so many times we make a bold decision to, to spend a lot of money, to get a student a coat that they desperately need, or some gym shoes, or to buy the more expensive food that we know that they really, really like and it just plain tastes better, or to get a name brand backpack that doesn't look like it's a freebie, or sometimes to send out snacks to the elementary social workers so that they can help a couple of kids at their school too so that they don't have to take out the money from their own pockets. And as soon as the shelf board decides to spend that couple of hundred dollars, another check will arrive in the mail in either that amount or the greater amount from a charitable organization or a church here in our town. It always happens. It happens so often that we have coined a phrase on the shelf board called God math because it always seems to be working out. And it's humbling to see this community support and abundance for feeding our high school students. You give them something to eat. You get to be part of God's math. You get to be part of the feeding of the world. You get to be part of God's work. But the story continues. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down there. About 5,000 men were there. I want to teach you just a couple of quick things about this part of the passage. First of all is this five small barley loaves. The barley loaves detail indicates that this boy, this child giving up his food was poor. A barley loaf would be only the food of somebody who was poor at the time, meaning that this boy was giving up out of his own poverty. And the other detail I want to show you here is about this 5,000 men were there. This doesn't include women and children, which the other gospel accounts account to. So it's more likely that this number is closer to 20,000 people. So let's continue. Jesus took the loaves and gave thanks and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled the baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. God math, mic drop. You see, I think that we think that our giving of $20 or $100 or $1,000 a week isn't going to be enough. That it's not going to be enough to change things. That it's not going to be enough to change us. That it's not going to be enough to help other people out. So instead, when it comes to our money, we hold on to it with clenched fists. What if, what if I need it? What if something comes up? What if? So why does the church ask us for money? Because God loves us so much that God invites us into the work that God is doing. You see, giving helps us to see the world with abundance, to hold our money with open hands, and to see others with generous hearts, just like the boy and his loaves of bread and his fish. I mean, think about it with me for a second today. In God's economy, you don't have anything that God needs. You don't have anything that God requires. I mean, God is God, right? But the truth is, you do have things that your neighbor needs that the other people on the mountainside need, that your church needs. The miracle here isn't that God multiplied it. The miracle here is that God invites us in it. <laughs> God invites us to be a part of what God is doing, to join in what God is doing, to join in what the church is doing, to join in what the community is doing. And I don't know about you, but I am humbled and overwhelmed to imagine that the God of the universe, the creator of everything, wants me to be a part of it. You mean God wants to partner with me? <laughs> and here's the real thing. This is true for you too. God wants to partner with you. And this is why we give. I don't know about you, but I believe that no one, no one at all should have a hunger time. 
I believe that there's enough food in the world so that we can all be fed. I believe that there's enough hope in the world so that we can all have joy. I believe there's enough Jesus in the world so that we can all be freed. I believe there's enough generosity in the world so that we can all be cared for. And I believe that there's enough people in the world so that we can all find community that I believe that no one should have a hunger time. So God invites us into God's work in the world. God invites us to be part of it. God says, you give them something to eat. As we uh, cleaned up the bowls in Ghana and finished handing out the mosquito nets with, with tears still sliding down our dry cheeks, an elderly woman in the village came up to me and she wanted to talk to me. And a translator helped her as she looked up at me and, and smiled a wide smile and grabbed my hands in her dry hands. And she said to me this, she said, Gi Nayami, which is a symbol in Ghana. It's a symbol in Ghana that means except for God. Like, no one knows except for God. No one is in charge of it except for God, that kind of thing. And as she held my hands, she thanked me for bringing the team and thanked us for giving them mosquito nets and dewormer. And I said with such deep sadness that I just wished that there was more that I could do. And she smiled and she said, Ye Naomi. And as we got onto the bus, we were silent. Our whole team just sat there in silence, staring out the window. Because the difficulty of seeing that kind of hunger, it, it was a lot to process. And after we had been driving down the road about 20, 30 minutes, that's when we heard it. A big splat on the windshield. And then another splat, and another splat, a plink, plink here and there as the rain began to fall and fall hard aggressively quenching, giving promise to the previously dry, beaten farmland, Guy, Miami. My friends, there are so many hungry people out there. There are people hungry for acceptance. There are people hungry to feel like they are enough. There are people hungry to feel free from the burdens of this life. There are people hungry for connection. There are people hungry for good news. Are people hungry for a place where they can just totally be themselves, messy and imperfect? There are people hungry for love. They're hungry for a church to be a place of acceptance, love, respite, and connection. And many of them are just actually plain hungry. And we wonder what we can even do about it. If our meager lives, our tithes and offerings can make any difference at all, whether it will be enough. And I believe that Jesus says to us with a little smirk like he gave to Philip on his face. He says, what have you got? Some fish, some bread, a little bit of love, some pocket change, some time to give, a listening ear, some leadership skills. Oh, you just got yourself. Join me. Come partner with me and watch this because that'll be more than enough. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing calls for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount I'm fixed upon it mount of Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, Lord, 
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to worship today. We are so glad you've chosen to join us. And if you are new to Calvary, here, here's our hope and prayer. Our hope and prayer is that today is not your last time with us. Uh, if you are new to Calvary, one of the best ways that you can get engaged in the life of faith here at Calvary is by heading out to our website and uh, hitting the button, sign up for emails. Get yourself on our email list. Every week we send out a note about all the things that are happening in the life of faith. We'd love for you to join us on the journey of faith here at Calvary. Uh, if you're together with maybe family or your connect group and would like to keep the conversation going about our conversation about generosity today, you can, you, you can use a discussion guide that's also found on our website, calvaryalec.org. Uh, hit that button that says discussion guide and, and keep the conversation going. Uh, we also want to invite you, if you are ever in the Alexandria community, to join us for in-person worship. We worship every Sunday at 8.30 and 10.30, as well as Wednesday evenings at both 5.30 and 6.30. We would love to have you join us. Hey, we are in the midst of what we are calling our annual a giving appeal. Every year, this time of year, we invite people who call Calvary their church home to make a commitment, to plan, to make a plan for how you are going to give financially in the coming year. If you consider Calvary your church home, you likely received in the mail a brochure, a packet that looks just like this. We want to invite you to read through it carefully and then make a commitment to your church family. We are the Ostlins. I'm Clay. 
I'm Kristen. I'm Brooklyn. I'm Gun. I'm Maddie. And this is Weston. Uh, Kristen and I actually grew up in the Brandon Evansville area, and we uh, left town for college. And uh, when Kristen graduated from uh, her master's degree, we got offered a job back here in Alexandria. When we came back to Alexandria, we checked around at a few different churches just to see if we were in the right spot, and every time we landed back at Calvary. One of the things I love about Calvary is that they always have um, good church music, and it's fun, and you just want to get up and dance. And also, Pastor Hans and Angie always make their sermons so exciting. What do you like, Maddie? Um, I like to go to Calvary at the lake. Oh, okay. yes, that's a good and one. Gavin, yeah, what do you like? I like suckers. The suckers. The suckers. They're your favorite. How many suckers do you eat every week? All of them. I think, <laughs> I think you probably have about 10 every Sunday. Growing up, we... We attended church regularly, but our church service was, you went to listen to a message that you really couldn't connect to. Uh, I wasn't personal. I was not able to take what was being preached and understand it to how it relates to my life. We had the big green book of hymnals that we would sing every verse on them, and they all sounded the same. And then you come to Calvary and the message every week, even if it's not something that I was thinking about, it's relatable. Um, and the stories and the examples that, that are used, they are relatable to just everyday people. And I think that's the biggest difference for me. And then we do get to listen to some pretty good music that we don't have to sing all five verses to. So uh, that's fun. <laughs> I like so that. I grew up uh, in a different denomination and it was one of those church settings where you had to attend, not make a peep. I remember even being a little kid and we were not allowed to make a single sound. And then um, fast forward to having four children and sitting in Calvary and I mean they're encouraged to get up and dance and sing along and if somebody's squawking or making a fuss, nobody cares. You're not getting that stare down because your child is interrupting the service. It's, it's welcome because that's just the season of life we're in. Now that our kids are starting to participate in the Wednesday night service. I haven't been exposed to that before. And so it's, it's really interesting and, and a, it's been a good experience for me to come in and see hundreds of teenagers. And it, it shows me that we're doing something different at Calvary. What Calvary is doing is taking this uh, overwhelming stigma of church and something that you have to do every single week and turning it into just an experience, something that is fun, something that students want to do. Um, it's not just about sitting through an hour-long service on a Sunday. It's about going out into the community and being the church. Everything that they do is taking in and then pushing it straight back out into the community so others can be blessed. Would you join us in making a commitment to Calvary's 2022 Giving Appeal? Folks, I would love for you to join me in making a commitment to our 2022 General Fund Stewardship Appeal. You can do that in two ways. The easiest way is simply go out to our website, hit the button that says give, and sign up for automated giving. It's the easiest way to give to your church. The other way is in the brochure and in worship, we have been giving out these pledge cards. You simply fill in the information and then you can either drop it in the offering plate here or use the envelope that's provided, mail that in. We're asking all pledges all to be made by November 1st. Folks, last but certainly not least today, we just wanna say a huge thank you for your incredible, incredible generosity. As we close our service today, we close with a time of offering. You can see the ways that you can give on the screen. First of those is simply to head out to our website. Again, hit that button that says give. The second, you can give simply by using Venmo right on your phone. Third, you can write a check, drop it in the mail to the address on the screen. Or if you're not sure how to make a gift or you'd like to make a special gift, please give us a call here in the church office. We'd love to connect with you. Folks, thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great day.